We had left off talking about Linux ext3, um, and just as a reminder, right, it's a little faster than XP6 for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is we can have more than one commit going at once. Right, so in XP6, you have a commit open, you run some system calls. When the last one leaves, you close it. You don't let any other system calls using disk IO or disk writes operate until everything is to the log, and not only to the log, but then from the log copied into the data blocks and file system. And so ext3 says, well, let's relax that somewhat. We can have multiple commits. There's only one active commit where new system calls are going, but there are multiple commits that may have written to the log, but they haven't necessarily made it from the log out to the file system. And so these are kept in this circular log, where we might have a set of blocks consisting of a transaction here, and then another one here, and then let's say another one here. And all three of them will be replayed in case we have to reboot. Right. So the mode that we use, this journaled mode, unfortunately is slow. And the reason is everything again is still going to the log and then to the file system. And the fact is, most of the data that's written is in files. The metadata is usually much less. And so the ordered data says, let's not go ahead and log everything. Let's just log the metadata so that the file data is not going to get logged. All right, so that means there's a pot potential problem. But it's not going to be catastrophic like the file system itself will lose its integrity. Just files, <laughs> um, which still is better, right? So what we'll do is we won't commit our metadata until all of the file data is written first to disk. Okay? So we have our, let's say, file data. This is in memory. And we have our metadata. Okay, again, in memory. And what we'll do is first write the file data. And only then will we commit the metadata. So what we know is that when we go to replay, if necessary, the file data is already there. Okay. Does that make sense? Roughly, I mean, we need to look at what can go wrong. This seems yeah, Sean. Yes. So in the other way, we know that writes to a file complete. Let, well, let's look at how this can go wrong. Okay. So let's say we. I don't know. Uh, we write some data. Okay, and that let's do a simple, the simplest possible example. So we write some data at the end of a file. Okay, so we um, and let's say the file size was I don't know two hundred bytes, and we write a hundred bytes. What metadata needs to get updated? The size and only the size, right? We don't need any new blocks. So what will happen if we do our write? of the data, but don't actually update our size. The, well, actually, in this case, nothing bad happens. Because basically, basically what will occur is our data block on disk, so this is our data block, will contain the old 200 plus a new 100. OK? And that's actually, but as far as the file system is concerned, it's only 200 bytes big. So therefore, we're not going to be looking at that 100. So this is a failure mode that's not really much of a failure mode. So, but let's think if we can extend this to a way in which we would have a failure. Uh, let's say we uh, 
Uh, you got one, Sarah. What if you write like 200 like new bytes, but start on a 100 byte offset, so you're writing over some of the end of the what was there before, and writing like extended things? Couldn't you get in a situation where we like? Mm, I like that example. So let's say we're writing. We have there the numbers one to the bytes, one to 200. Let's say. Okay. And now we overwrite the entire block. So we, we did have or let's just make it simple. We have 200 ones. Okay? And now we go back and we go to the front, the beginning of the file, and we write 300 zeros. Okay? What we want is 300 zeros. How many zeros do we end up with in the case that we crash after we write the 300 zeros before we update our size? We end up with 200 zeros. Now, maybe that's really bad. You know, 200 ones is good and 300 zeros is good, but 200 zeros launches the nuclear missiles. Who knows, right, when you go back and read. So we've got now a file that is possibly corrupt. Right? The metadata all around it is fine, but the contents of it are not either one thing, which was 200 ones, or the other thing, which was 300 zeros. Okay, so does that, does that make sense? And we'll see, actually, there are some further problems one can happen that actually the journaling system needs to be aware of, the logging system. OK, if there's no crash, there's no problem. If there's no crash, we don't even care about logging, right? Um, but if we have a crash before the commit, again, the block has the new data. Perhaps it's not visible, like the case we just talked about, since we didn't update the inode. If we allocated a new block, because we made the file bigger, and it required us to spill over to a new block, what's happened here? Right, so, we, so we have a file that's one block big on disk. And now we do a write. And that causes us now to get a second block on disk. But we crash before we update the inode. So the two things that we wanted to update the inode about were the size and the new block. And actually, there's a third thing now we're going to have to update for our metadata. What's that besides the inode? The bitmap. Yeah, so we've got to the metadata to update is the inode. And that's the size and the new block and the free bitmap. So we don't, we, we crash before we commit. And so what does this look like? What it looks like is we've got our file with its old size. Okay, so our size is the same. If we have happen to have overwritten that, the data will be different. But if not, we haven't. And there's this other block on disk. Tell me about this block. Is it free? Yes, because how do we define free? We look at the free bitmap. And the free bitmap still shows it as free because it was never updated. So this is free, but that's OK. Has anyone ever used this? Does anyone ever reference this block? No, the only one who should have referenced the block was the inode that we didn't yet get to update. So we're actually kind of OK. We just we, we lost the right off the end of the file, even if it allocated space. So I'm understanding it's something for multiple transactions being bundled into one kind of For thing. sure. So what if we bundle something that frees that second block, and then we have this thing which writes to it, and then the whole thing gets reversed? OK, so right let's say. <laughs> So let's, let's say we go ahead and um, reuse a block, OK? So here's an example. Well, actually, let's do 0, which is your example. So let's see if we get it. So 0 is we have one system call. And this is in a single transaction, right? So one system call is going to free up some space. So let it all truncate. Yeah, truncate's a file. 
And another system call by this or a different process uh, extends a file and it reuses the same block. Right, so this is your uh, editor, let's say, and this is your compiler. And so when you're done, that data block contains object code or executable code. And it started life as some source code that you did delete, admittedly. You don't like the source code there anymore, but you expect to open your file back up again, your hello.world.c, and have it be empty. And it actually, you open up again, and it could have executable data in it. But is that the case? Is that what would happen? So let's say we crash before we come in. We know that this block now contains executable code, right? So this was a .c file, contents, and now it has, you know, .o contents. And since we didn't update the metadata yet, in fact, we have now a file that ends in .c, and we open it up again, and it has object code in it. Does that make sense, how that can happen? All right. Which is bad for, I don't know, several reasons, I'd say. Give me one reason. If those two files belong to different users, now someone can read someone else's data. Yeah, we have a, a huge possible security. Now, it was data they wanted to delete anyway, so, well, maybe that was even more sensitive then, because they wanted to delete it, right? So, yeah, so. Uh, that'd be bad. So the solution is don't reuse a block until the system call that freed it commits, right? Because once it commits, then we'll be okay. Make sense? So don't reuse it in this, uh, well, yeah, don't reuse it. Okay. Now let's look at this example. We, do a, we remove a directory and we reuse the block, what block? The block for the directory, the block containing directory entries. So this is the block containing directory entries. And then we write to some file in the same way as the compiler, let's say, writes. Okay. Now, a block that used to contain directory contents now contains object file contents. But if we don't get a chance to commit, we crash, we come back up, now all of a sudden we've got a directory, we look at its block, we try to interpret the data there, and we think it's um, directory entries and it's really executable and that would be bad. Bad inodes, certainly there'll be unpleasant file names. Okay. So the previous thing we just talked about, which is don't reuse a block until the system call um, that freed it is committed takes care of that. But then we get another one that's, I think, really interesting. So here's what we do. We make a directory. All right, so we make a directory. So that is going to cause us to have a directory entry here, right? And then we commit. And then we remove a directory. So we remove the same directory. So now this one goes away and we commit, and then we reuse that block. We've already committed, okay? And so now we do a um, create, let's say, and that reuses that block. And these all committed. So you think, well, what's the problem? We've got these in the log, right? So we've got three things in the log. Log. We've got the make dir, which of course doesn't show up as make dir, right? It's just up, updating some um, uh, metadata information. We've got our remove dir, right? So this is in the log, and we've got our write or create slash right. All right, so what's going to happen? Uh, 
the so let's look at what happens. Let me remind. So we replay the make dir. Okay, what's that going to do? <coughs> Sorry, hold on just a second. I'm just I, there's a there's a subtlety here that I'm all of a sudden just forgotten. Yes. Well, V did get committed. So we put them in the log. And so therefore, by definition, they've been committed. We might not have installed them into the file system yet, but they're committed. Okay, Sarah? Yeah, let me. So, oh, yeah, yeah. When we replay the log, this actually is going to write to our data block. Our, it's a file, so it's a directory block, right? Directories are part of our, they, our metadata, right, as opposed to file blocks. So when we do this, we're going to go ahead and write a dot and a dot dot, write an empty directory to this data block, just like we did to begin with. Right? So we're going to write it in here. Then when we remove it, we're going to remove it. And then the create and write is going to say, I don't need to do anything here because except update the inode, because I know the data for this is already on disk. Okay. So the data for this one isn't, isn't on disk, because the directory is part of our metadata. So it writes it, it removes it, and then it just assumes it's correct. So what we did in this case, when we re replayed it, is we overwrote this data that had been written in the write And so, it seems crazy, but what you really have to do is say, okay, if we're removing the directory, anything prior to that in the log that did anything to that directory and that directory entry, don't do it, okay? Or really, in removed, we're saying, if we are removing this block, okay, because it's not really thinking about it as a directory. If we're removing this block, don't do anything earlier in the commits that writes to the block, because we're going to remove it. So it's, it's, it's not only useless to write to it, it actually can be bad to write to it. So the removeder is going to really say, right, this is really going to be, you know, remove block, you know, 37, uh, update an inode, update a free uh, bitmap. And so for this case, it's going to throw into the log something that says basically revoke block 37, which says block 37 is going away. Anything prior to that in the commit, don't do it. Don't write to it. So that means as we are actually installing from the commit log, we actually have to look ahead and see, before I do this writing, has it actually been revoked? So this is an example of a complication with the fact that we're not having everything go through the log. Does that make sense? Because if everything went through the log, we don't have these issues. But since part of it's going through the log and part of it's not going through the log, that's an issue. So do you want that create and write to happen or don't? So that's after. here's what's going to happen. This create write, what's actually going to happen here? We're writing to a data file. So this is. This is a create write system call, or set of system calls here. Let's say all in one transaction. The write 
does have an effect on the metadata, right? So all we care about is what happened to the metadata here. So this is going to be update inode, update dir entry, update free block, and that's it, right? That's, so there's no actual write there to a data block. Because we've said we don't write to, to file blocks in the, via the log. We write external to the log. So it's just uh, complicated, and you have to think about all the things that could go wrong and make sure that you have mechanisms to avoid those. Okay, we're going to see a completely different kind of file system today where the approach they take is just so nice. It means transactions just work. Okay? Um, so the summary, right, we just... Don't write metadata to the on-disk file system until we've committed to the log. Because if we're updating metadata and we're in the middle of updating the metadata and we fail, then uh, we have a big problem because we can be in an inconsistent state. Wait for all the system calls in one transaction to finish before we start another one. Uh, don't op uh, overwrite something in the buffer cache before it's in the log. Don't free the log space until we've written that stuff. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. And then in this ordered mode, we write the data block before we commit. By the way, most people use this ordered mode right, on, on ext3. So this is just sort of the, I think it's the default as well. Of course, most people have no idea what, I mean, my guess is, most users have no idea what the different journaling modes are. There's, let's just throw out another corner case. I think I've talked about the fact that if you open a file, and then remove it, right? unlink it from the file system, it's still open, and you can still read and write to it. The inode is still there until its ref count goes to zero. So the inode has a link count that tells how many directories refer to it, and in memory there's a reference count that says how many opens do we have of it. And not until both the open count goes to zero and the link count goes to zero does it get removed from the file system. So let's say you open a file and unlink it. And this is a handy way to deal with a temporary file that you're guaranteed will go away when you're done. So the unlink commits. Unlink doesn't free up the blocks, but it's gone from the directory. You have a crash. And there's nothing interesting because that inode is not on a, it's, it's, it doesn't show as free, but yes, no one's referring to it. Okay. And all the blocks aren't on the free list, yet there's no way to get to them. So the solution is kind of for this particular odd Unix thing, when you remove a, a file, go ahead and add that inode to the super block. So put that inode on the super block and keep a linked list of these things that are things that need to be removed, inodes that are not referred to from any directories, but that need to be gotten rid of. Um, and checksumming, I'm going to just skip checksumming for right now and go into the full ZFS checksumming. Okay. So NEXT3 doesn't even have checksumming, but EXE4 does. So let's go on to ZFS. So it turns out ZFS used to stand for the Zettabyte file system, but it now stands for nothing. It's just ZFS. But the FS, it's file system. It really is. So developed in the 2000 at Sun, now been acquired by Oracle. Unfortunately, it has an unpleasant Oracle open source license such so that it doesn't distribute with Linux. But it is available as, uh, to install on Linux. Uh, at one point, it was going to be the file system for the Mac, but there are two room, three different rumors as to what happened. One is that there was a tweet or an announcement that someone made from Oracle that said, hey, Suns, or Ma Apple is going to be announcing ZFS for the Mac next week at their developer conference. This is when Steve Jobs was alive. And you know what? Steve Jobs does not like being upstaged, and he does not like a secrecy being broken. And so 
One story is they pulled it the week before it was to be announced. Okay. The second was um, that Oracle and Apple were arranging a license for this and that it went up to the head of Oracle. What's his name? Uh, Larry Elson. And Larry said, Steve is my friend and I don't, mean, don't mix business with friendship, so no, can't have this license. And the other is that basically Steve said the same thing with some swearing. So, <laughs> so anyway, we don't, have, we don't have it available for the Mac, but there's a, there is a port available for the Mac, right? but it's not uh, the default. So here's sort of the most traditional file system. You have a disk, you install a file system on it, a single file system. What's one step up from that? We have our disk, and I am proud of my disks here. It's, it's, it's not bad. OK, so we break this up into multiple portions, possibly unequal. In fact, we often call this partitioning, right? And we break this up into separate file systems. So this might be file system one, file system two, and file system three. Now, question number one. When you're using Unix, how many file systems are there? I Knut, <laughs> for example. Six. Six. I only see one. There's a slash, and everything's below that. So it must be a single file system, right? No, right? So what we've got is we have our hierarchy here. And for a reason that will become clear, I will switch colors here. And let's do another color here. Okay. So each of these is itself a file system. And this is a, a Unix-y thing. Oh, let me try this. On Windows, how many file systems? Or MS-DOS. 26 is actually a good number, right? So we've got A and B for our floppy drives, and then C, D, E, F, G, colon, right? All those are different file systems that might be on the same disk or multiple disks, depending on how your partition thinks. So the, the Unix way, I think, was pretty smart, which is to say we're not going to put these designators in front. We are going to mount this file system at this particular location. So that we basically said mount this green file system such that its, it root, its root is at this location here. Mount this red file system, so it's here. An example of common mounting is like the home directories. Right? Everyone's, what is it, use, I don't know what it is on Canoes. Is it user home or something? Let's say it's user home roads. And then that user home is an entire file system that's mounted there. Or slash temp is often a separate file system, right? which maybe you have in, might even make a RAM file system for. So anyway. We have multiple file systems that we patched, glue together, sort of, to look like one. Does that make sense? All right. Now we start getting multiple disks. What do we do? Well, the standard thing that was done was to say, let's make glue together multiple disks to appear like one disk. So here's an example where we have a concatenated, so we have a Tiny little hard drive, right? But one fits better in here. I, I could make it larger that way. So we have a one gigabyte, we have two one gigabyte hard drives. And we are going to make them appear like a single two gigabyte hard drive, concatenated together. So this is the first half of the two gigabyte, and this is the second half of the two gigabyte. Right? And then our file system is none the wiser, right? It used to deal in block numbers from one to n. Now it deals in block numbers from one to two n. But it doesn't even realize but it's two drives and doesn't need to. Or you could do striped, where here we're going to take even and odd blocks. So block number zero, block number one, block number two, block number three, block number four, block number five. Why? What advantage would there be in doing this striping as opposed to doing this concatenation? Why would it matter whether it's one to n and n plus one to two n, or all the odds and all the evens, or rather, all the evens and all the odds. Nadika. Is there 
Actually, that's a good point. So as you fill up your file system, you maybe use your bitmap free block, and you may allocate stuff at the beginning first. And so it may be that you've got this lower one. If you've got a, disk, a file system that's about half full, this might be close to 100% full, and this might be close to 0% full, and that seems wasteful, right? You could write in parallel, exactly. Yeah, so you could, you could issue, if you're doing a sequential multi-block write, you could issue it to both of them at once, so that'd be faster, right? And also for sustained reads, your throughput could be higher, right? If you had a long, contiguous file, then you could be reading from here and here simultaneously, basically. Okay, so that's striping. We'll come back to striping later. And then we also got mirroring. We can treat two one gig hard drives as one one gig hard drive. Well, that's not rocket science, right? I, I know how to treat n hard drives as one hard drive. Just ignore n minus one of them, right? What advantage do we have here? If one of your hard drives breaks, you still have most of your data. Yeah, if one of your hard drives breaks, presumably your other hard drive has everything you might need. Okay, so this is mirroring. We'll talk a little bit more about this as, as well. Okay, part, part of the challenge is how to know when your data's gone bad. So, um, so we're going to contrast here. This is the volume approach on the top. So the volume approach says your file system shouldn't need to know. Okay, leave the file system alone and just let it deal with volumes and let the volume manager deal with these complexities of the fact that there are multiple drives and so on and the fact that there's mirroring and all this thing. And ZFS said, I think it'd be better if we had a file system that had knowledge of things so that, so that it wasn't only, right, this interface between the file system and the volume is blocks and only blocks. And the interface between volume and disk is also blocks. Read block n, write block n. And it turns out, ZFS said, a higher higher level API here to the file system turns out to be helpful. What's this interface here between the storage pool and the disks? It's gotta be blocks. That's all they know how to do is read and write blocks. So this is still blocks. Okay. But ZFS says, you know what? We're gonna have this storage manager and it's gonna be responsible for the drives. And it's going to present storage that's available not just to a single file system, but to multiple file systems. Why would, might we prefer this picture over this picture, given we have the same number of file systems and the same number of drives? Say that again. For large files, tell me more. That's exactly a good way to describe it. You have more options, right? It's, it's very similar to when we were talking about memory management and talked about having fixed size partitions to run programs in and how that was, that was difficult because you had a lot of uh, internal fragmentation. Here you can imagine if this file sits, so these are one gigabyte drives and let's just say they're uh, concatenated, okay? So we have two gig here, two gig here, and two gig here and we have a file system that's 90% full here 10% full here, and 99% full here, and it wants to get bigger, but it can't. Whereas here, the space can go to whoever needs it. Right. Also, there's potentially a performance yeah. advantage because you'd be able to have a single, parts of a single file system striped over more disks. Yes, you could. So here, we've got, yeah, a file in this file system is only striped <laughs> over two disks if this is striped, and here we can actually stripe over all six disks if we want to, to increase our performance. Another nice thing is, have you ever had the situation where you get a bigger hard drive? Yeah, no one gets smaller hard drives. So you get a bigger hard drive and you need to then copy the data over, right? And you also then somehow repartition, right? And at least in the past, a lot of times the repartitioning was destructive, 
right, when you, when you repartition. And so it'd be nice if you could somehow repartition without being destructive. Like, there's enough room in this storage pool to just throw in another pair of drives. And the storage pool allocator says, OK, now I have more space I can allocate. Great. So it's very flexible. What happens when your old hard drives break? They don't take care of that. Yeah. No, when old hard drives break, there is a facility for bringing one offline. Um, and basically, it'll try and copy all the data off of it that might be on there to any of the other data. And then it'll say, OK, I'm not going to put anything new on here, and I will copy all the stuff out. And then you can replace it. And it even has hot swaps. So you can have, what are they called, uh, like warm spares that are just sitting there, connected, but not doing anything, waiting for one of these to go bad. And you can say, OK, take, get rid of this one and throw in this one. Sarah? Does it integrate with RAID, or does it expect RAID underneath? It does not expect RAID underneath. It does RAID for you. Okay. So I don't know if any, any of you have used RAID controllers. Um, they're good and bad. Part of the problem is it's hardware. And people who look at hardware, those are like drivers, and they're just, <laughs> they often come from a more hardware background than a software background, is all I'm saying. Exactly, arbitrary number of disks, arbitrary terminal file systems. Yes, all shared between them. What a partition is? So a partition is basically just taking a disk and saying, this contiguous space in it is reserved for this thing, and this is reserved for this thing. So when you have a partition, um, there's a little bit of hardware involved in that the hardware will read a boot block. Okay. So that boot block is, needs to be at, I believe it's block zero. From then on, it's, it's software. But that partition is software, but it's a, um, there's a standard. For, well, the nice thing about standards is how many, there's multiple standards for how to partition. Um, does that make sense? So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a dual boot uh, Mac where you can boot Windows and boot Mac. You will have your drive broken up into a Mac file system and a separate Windows file system. Or if, dual booting Linux and Windows, for example, as well. OK? All right, so the advantage of the pooling, we have this done in file system size. All the storage is shared. You can easily add new drives. We talked about all those things. Data integrity was another issue that is addressed by ZFS. So the checksumming, so it's interesting that although ZFS uses transactions, it doesn't use logs. I mean, there's, yeah. In the standard case, it doesn't use logs, okay? So let's look at an example of checksums. And checksums are common, uh, or not uncommon, uh, and so let's say you have a checksum. So you have a data block, and at the end of it, you put a checksum. Okay? So think of it as I have kind of a, an address, which is my block number. Right? So the address is my block number. And I go to that block number, I read the block, and I compare the last four bytes and do a checksum and make sure it, it matches. So the question is, what sort of errors can this catch? I, you familiar with the term bit rot? So it's used in a couple different ways. One is magnetic media, or media in general, that go bad over time. So magnetic media all over time. Those that optical disks, or, you know, CD-ROMs and so on, um, have similar issues. And so the bits just go bad. Um, bit rot is also often used to describe software that, you know, hasn't been maintained. It, it's just... It's like doesn't seem right, but the software goes bad over time. And the reason is everything else around it changes, right? If everything else around it stayed the same, you'd be fine. So if you have an original Mac 
and you have some original Mac software, and assuming the floppy drive is working and the, the hardware is working, it'll work. But when you try to take that same software and run it on today's Mac, even though this backwards compatibility has been maintained and that won't necessarily work. So anyway, I'm talking about the first kind of bit rot, which is the physical bit rot, as opposed to the metaphorical bit rot. So will it catch? Let me talk about what these is, these are, and then I want you to talk in small groups about which one was. Accidental overwrite. So you accidentally uh, overwrite some data. Okay. Uh, you have a bug in your driver. Memory errors. Cosmic rays are real things, right? They can flip bits in memory. So if you have a memory error, well, the fact that you have this checksum catch that. Misdirected reads and writes. This can be either your software or your file system, your driver, or the actual controller. So you say, I want to write this to block 35, and it actually writes it to block 38. Or you say, I want to read block 38, and it reads back block 35. Or phantom writes. Phantom write is, you said write, and it just never happened. Okay, take 60 seconds, groups of two or three or four, and circle which one of these that checksums stored in each block could actually find. Oh, and just to, just to tell you, a checksum, right, a checksum is, the simplest example would be you XOR all the bytes together, right? It, it's like parity is one example. But, uh, give me an example. Oh, it's cosmic rays happen so rarely, just imagine there's only one. Yeah, yeah. Any any checksum only has a certain number of bit errors that can handle. Yeah, yeah. But let's just say even one. Yeah, one of these events happens alone. Detecting, not fixing. And if you want, you can write on the board to do oh, this. <laughs> All right. Yes. Is the checksum like an extra number, or is it like? Checksum is an extra number whose size is dependent on the kind of checksum. And the larger it is, the more you can catch and possibly fix. In the simplest case, you could think of it as a single bit which is just the XOR of everything that came before it. Right, that's, that's minimal, yeah. minimal checksum. Can we detect bit rot? We have one bit goes rotten. Okay, and admittedly, one, start, one bit starts going rotten. It's like a bushel of apples. The rest start going bad, too. That's not actually true. But, um, so we have our data block here. We have one of our bits go bad in the data or the checksum. When we go read this block off a disk, do we know there was an error? We know there's an error because we'll go recalculate the checksum and we'll find it doesn't match. Yay! We found a problem. What we'll do about it is a different story, but we found a problem, so that's good. Can we find that we tried to write a block and it never got written? No, because when we go read that, we'll read the contents, the old contents of the block, right? We, we thought we wrote new stuff. We wrote, you know, 2018's tax return, and we go read it, and it's 2017 tax return, but it's checksum beautiful, right? Calculated a year ago. So we don't know that. Misdirected read and write. We wrote, we asked to write to block 35, and it actually wrote to block 38. So when we go read from block 35, we'll get the old contents, which will have a good checksum. When you read from 38, we'll get the old contents. We'll have to good check some. We, we don't know that it happened. If we have a memory error, 
So a cause, so let's, let me give you the, the scenario. We're going to write a block. We go through, we calculate the checksum. The cosmic ray comes in and it hits one of the bits. And now we write it. Well, the checksum's not going to match anymore, right? Hmm. This is an example that I didn't actually mean. So this one will catch the cosmic ray. Uh, what if the cosmic ray comes in before we calculate the checksum? OK. Well, if it comes in before we calculate the checksum, then uh, we'll calculate a consistent checksum, uh, and we'll never know about it. Okay. Driver bugs. So if we have driver bugs, again, all we can really tell is there's a block here. And it is internally sort of self-consistent. There's a block. Yes, this is a block, and it was written at some point in the past. But I don't know anything more than that. Like, was this a block that's intended to be here or not? Or was there a newer block that was supposed to be here? Don't know. Okay. So here's what we're going to do instead. We're going to say this is the ZFS approach. So in the ZFS approach, when we have an address, it's going to contain not just a block number. And we're going to see later that it doesn't actually even contain a block number. But for the moment, this whole process works even if we had a real block number. But we're going to always, when we refer to a block, we're going to say block number plus checksum. Plus, I don't mean addition. I mean the ordered pair, block and checksum. And so when we go get this data and pull it back, guess what we do? We check some and we say, does it match what we expected? Now this is a lot nicer because if I'm going to get block 35, right, so we write block 35 and it gets misdirected or disappears. Yeah, so it gets misdirected to 38. When I wrote block 35, I knew the checksum. Let's say the checksum is, I don't know, 52. And the old 35, which is on disk, has a checksum, right, if I calculated it. I'm not storing it in here, but if I calculated it, the old checksum was 99. So I write this block. I know what its checksum should be. It writes, I'm done, I think life is happy. Later on, I go through and I say, read block 35. Do I know what the checksum should be? Yes, because I'm storing it in my address. Wherever I store the 35, I'm storing the checksum right along with it. And so I can verify not only, right, when block 35 comes back, I can check that the checksum equals 52, because I know the checksum, because I'm always storing 52 comma, sorry, 35, which is the block number, and the checksum, 52. And this is the address that I always store. I never store just a raw block number. Whenever I'm referring to block number, I always store the checksum that I think it should be. And so when I read block 35, it reads the old 35 because the, the, the previous write got lost. I calculate the checksum. It's 99. It doesn't match 52. I know I have a problem. I have a couple of different possibilities. Question. So in theory, would like, the best possible checksum be like the actual file? Yeah, but that takes up a lot of space. Yeah, well, so yeah, there. The reason why I'm asking is because, like, um, like, like what you were saying, with the longer the checksum, like, yeah, it's more space, but it's also the less likely that, like, it's like some series of yeah. bits are just going to be dead. Like, yeah. The Let me give you an example of a checksum, okay? And this will maybe make it more clear. So, one checksum is just uh, an XOR, right? The parity, simplest case. Another might be an XOR on the bytes. So, that'll take us only eight bits to store. Other checksums are not really are used cryptographically, right? So secure hashes, right, are a form of a checksum where you take a sequence of bytes 
and you come up with a hash that's maybe 128 bytes, 64 bytes, I don't know how big, SHA-256, is that 256 bytes or bits? Uh, bits, okay, so that doesn't sound so big. So SHA-256 is a 256-bit uh, value such that it is unlikely that any two different files generate the same one, and more importantly, any small change to your original changes the, uh, the hash. So hash checksum can be considered similar sorts of things. So in a file system, anywhere we would have a block number, we're going to store this. Okay, so anywhere you need a block number, we're going to store the, the pair. So it'll solve bit rot, of course, because when I go back to read it, if what I wrote isn't the same, I will find it out from my checksum. A phantom write, again. I know when I wrote it what the checksum is I wanted, and it's not there anymore. Phantom write also has a different value. Misdirected reads and writes, they went somewhere else. I will, when I go read the block I wanted to write, find out it's still got an old value. And when I go read and write one of these over, overwritten ones that were misdirected, it'll also find bad value. Uh, driver bugs, yes, accidental overwrite. Memory errors, too, in the sense that if I'm reading the block from disk, into memory until I get to actually calculating the checksum, I can catch a, uh, a flip bit. Right? Cosmic rays are one way you can get flip bits, and other ways is just bad memory. Google was known in the early days. <coughs> they were very cheap, okay? And so they, uh, there were two things that are interesting. One <coughs> is you could rent rack space, right, at a, at a Server, locate, uh, data, center. data center, thank you, um, based on square feet. Okay, that's how they sold it. And so, what Google did, you couldn't go more high than anyone else. You know, you had a rack. But with, uh, what they did is they just stuffed that thing full of machines, right? So, they didn't use standard rack mount hardware where it's, you know, three or four <coughs> inches for a, for a given drive. They put it on little, um, you ever seen like bakers? They have bakery. They, they would actually use that and just like put them on balsa wood to keep them off the metal and just stuff it in there. And the data centers hated it, of course, because it, it generated so much heat. Um, but anyway, that's one problem they had. The second problem is that they also got discount memory. And so you could get memory cheaper that wasn't as good. Um, and so that actually was kind of good because it, it forced them to write code such that it would work in case of memory errors, or at least would know and fail silently as opposed to blowing things up. The reason that's good is, of course, as you scale to hundreds of thousands of machines, you're always going to have some sort of error you know, with bad memory. And so the fact that early on with smaller number of machines they had forced errors uh, was, anyway, was good. So. Um, and no one these days buys uh, parity memory, so, which is 9 bits instead of 8 bits, and will actually check on every access to make sure that the parity is right. But no one wants to pay for it, so hardly anyone uses it. OK, fundamental theorem of software engineering. And this is important. All problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. Virtual memory is a good example of that. So in virtual memory, we said, I know how to try and deal with this internal fragmentation and external fragmentation and so on. Let us go ahead and not actually refer directly to the memory. Let us use an indirection where we have virtual addresses that then get mapped to logical addresses. And in order to make this remotely feasible, speed-wise, we'll use hardware to help us. So that is what ZFS does. So let me show you on the left side versus the right side. This left side has a system call. There's a vNode interface to the file system. So the vNode interface, sort of like inodes except virtual nodes. This is a level of abstraction that allows you to have a file, that allows you to have multiple kinds of file systems as long as they share this same interface. And also allows you to do things like 
Um, any of you using SSHFS to get to your files on your local machine from Knuth? Right, so it's actually using SSH in the file system to go over to the Knuth file system and copy stuff back to your machine and cache it. NFS is another example. Um, the way ZFS on Mac works is it comes in via this um, virtual file system. It's Fuse, I think, it's that interface. Okay, so we got our file system. File system has then an interface to the volume manager, which is a logical device and offset number, right? block number, you can think of this as. Right? So this is the logical single two gigabyte drive. And then the volume manager says, oh, I know that this offset actually goes to one or the other of the physical devices, and the offset may need to change. Right? So in the case it's concatenated, oh, this offset's between zero and one gig, I'll send it to the first device, it's one gig and two gig, I'll send it to the second device and subtract one gig from the offset. ZFS says, we're gonna have the same interface to the device driver, because it doesn't have a choice. We're gonna have the same interface to the system call, because it doesn't have a choice. But in between, it has a choice. It'll have a storage pool allocator. The storage pool allocator is going to provide a virtual address up above, not a physical address. By virtual address, we mean that it has a mapping from virtual addresses to physical addresses that can change. And that's really important. So that if we find that there's a drive that's going bad, we can stop sending requests to that and instead send to its mirror, for example. Or we find that this one drive is totally overloaded with stuff. We can move stuff from that drive to another drive and update this addressing. And not only is it just different in the fact that this is a virtual address, but you're actually allocating, it's more like malloc and free. You say, I want to allocate something that is 20,000 bytes. And it gives you back an address and says, okay, this is good for 20,000 bytes. And when you're done with it, you say, free. Okay, to get rid of it. So it's a higher level interface. And then the data management unit, on top of that, provides the idea of data sets. And a data set, think of as a file system right now, or it's what's, where a file system is gonna be stored. And within the data set, you have objects, and then offsets within these objects. So objects have size, and you can read and write to those objects. And then on top of that, ZFS, the POSIX layer, actually says, oh, objects? We'll have one object, which is, let's say, an object for every inode, okay? We'll have an object for every, the contents of every data file. We'll have an object for a directory, okay? I think that latter's true. The previous ones are definitely true. At this layer, and at this layer, there's no knowledge of free bitmap, free block, right? The free stuff is all down here. So we have higher and higher level abstractions as we work our way up. Uh, we can deallocate, right? As I talked about, we can allocate various si var variable sizes. Um, and I said here that it's block numbers that we store here. I lied. It's not block numbers. What do you think we store here? Say it again. Yeah, disk virtual address. Right. <coughs> Questions? All right. Here's part of what I think, I think is the prettiest thing about ZFS, okay? the way they handle committing transactions. And the way they handle tra committing transactions and avoid a lot of the difficulty that we've seen already and why we need a journal and so on and replaying is once a block has been written to disk, they don't change it. And you say, what? They don't change it, right? You instead allocate a new block with the contents you want. And eventually, 
you will point whatever was pointing at the old block at the new block. But when you point the old block at the new block, you're not going to change. So here we go. Old block, old block, point to old block. We're going to make a change. And let's think of what we're changing. We're going to write to a file. We don't need to allocate any more space. But we're going to change the data. And we also need to update what else, as well as the data in the file, if we're increasing the size, the metadata. So we got here, this is our data block. And this happens to be our inode. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go change the data block. And that gets done just by allocating a new data block. And we put whatever data we want into it. It may require reading this old block from disk, right, if we're just changing a byte in it. So we read it, we update it, we write it, and we also go update the inode. How do we update the inode? Copy on write. So we never actually change the inode. We duplicate it, change the size, and now we've got two new blocks. Anything they refer to that refers to those blocks need to change as well. So actually, the inode contains a list of data blocks, right? It's just like it is in Unix. So we've got our inode. And we had our size. And we had our blocks. All right? Our size was 32. And I'm going to change that to 33. All right? And our blocks here was, let's say it's two blocks long. So we've got the first block is 652 virtual disk address, check sum one, whatever that value is. And uh, 999, check sum two. Here's 999. The contents of it was. I don't know, A, B, C, sorry. Yes, we're not just, so it's A, B, C, one, two, three. And we change it, and now it's A, B, C, one, two, three, four. Okay, except we don't change it, do we? I'm not allowed to change it. What do we do instead? We copy it. So we're going over here, we're going over here. This is five, six, seven. And this is A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so copy. Similarly, actually, we didn't change this one, did we? Because we're not allowed to change. So this is inode at some location, right? At disk virtual address, you know, 756. So we copy this and change this to size. 34, 33, and our blocks. First block stays the same because we didn't change that. Second block changes, and that's now, what's it going to be? 5, 6, 7, and what's checksum going to be? Whatever the checksum is. Checksum 3, let's say. It's definitely not checksum 2. OK. Does writing those two blocks to disk, this block at 111, and this block at 567 change anything about the file system? No. no. The file system is immutable. Okay, the file system hasn't changed. Um, you might think the directory entry points to one, was pointing to 756 and now needs to be updated to 111. And then that directory entry would change, and that would cause the parent directory to change, and the parent directory to change? No. There's a level of indirection, because that solves all problems. And the level of indirection, it basically, it talks about inode 0, inode 1, inode 2, and there's a reference there to this. So there's probably some block that needs to change to actually show that mapping. I'm not going to, I'm gonna just ignore that right now. What the hell is this tree then, if it's not the directory tree? This is part of the. Merkle tree. So Merkle was a guy who patented this 
I don't remember the date. I think it was in the 90s. And a Merkle tree allows you to basically compute a master checksum. So what we've got here are data blocks. So the data blocks are at the leaves. And what we can do is for every, let's just say, pair for right now, we know the checksum of this, and we know the checksum of this. And we store that in here, right? So this arrow here really is a pair, which is the, the um, block number for this, or the disk virtual address for this and the checksum, the disk virtual address for this and the checksum. And then this is a value that we can now compute a checksum on, right? This is a sequence of bytes. So we compute a checksum of this, and a checksum of this, and those now go up into here. And at the very top, we have an Uber block. And the Uber block, there's no pointer to it to store checksum in. So it actually has an internal checksum. This is the only one that has an internal checksum. So you can verify all of the data by going up through these checksums, right? This one proves these two. But how do you trust this one? This one has the trust because it has its checksum. But how do you trust this one? You go all the way up to the Uber block. And as long as you have the Uber block and you know its checksum, then you can prove everything else down. Used for, you guys know of at least two things this is used for. Git is one example. Right? This is Git. When you see those commit hashes, those are those, basically. Okay. Another example, you can make lots of money this way. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Where you've got this history of everything that's happened, and all you really need to prove that history right, is your single current hash. So if you download that hash from somewhere trusted, you can download all the transactions from anywhere from wherever, China, Russia, wherever you don't trust, right? And then verify them, and as long as you verify then your final hash matches, you can, you can trust it. So we write these blocks. That means we need to update this block, but we don't update blocks, do we? We copy on write. So we copy it and update it. And then we do it for its parent, right? Even though this one isn't actually changing, to check some of this. And at this point, have we done anything to the file system? Nothing at all. We go update this one. So that means actually allocate a new block. And we're missing one step here, which is actually first we calculate the block and we write it. No, I take it back. So the Uber blocks are special. The Uber blocks, there's like a bunch of them at special locations on the drive. Okay. And the, part of what the Uber block contains is a uh, it's not a version number, I think it's a generation number. So if we crash here and we come back to life, the file system to look through all the Uber blocks and find the biggest one whose checksum matches itself. That's the latest version of the file system. So if we crashed here, that works. As we allocate this one, it's going to be one more than the previous generation. And if we write this successfully and then crash, when we come back up, this will be the new Uber block. If we write three quarters of this block, even though I said you, all or nothing for blocks, but if three quarters of it got managed to be written, what would happen on this? It would have the highest generation number, but its checksum wouldn't match because we didn't actually get a chance to write the entire block. And the checksum is across the entire block. So we would say, this is no good. We're going to go back to the previous one. Right? It finds the, the highest numbered one that is consistent. How, yes? How do you find out a parent? Um, like how do the, how do the blocks do know what these blocks are going to do? I don't know. <laughs> um, we can design a way to do that. I don't know.
the storage allocator would have to mark them as uh, in use. And there is the question of when do they get scavenged, right? Scavenged. Freed. When do they actually get freed up? Because we wouldn't want all those blocks to just be lost forever. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, right. so even while you're doing these copy of writes, they would partially have to break up the tree. Like, They're all still on disk. And, and, and then you'd be marking those, like, those bright green blocks as like, in use. Yes, they'd all be marked as As far as the, so this is all happening at the level above the storage allocator. So the storage allocator, as far as these concerned, these are all blocks and they're all in use. Yes. There are multiple places that refer to the same virtual address. They would all have to be updated. They, they, okay. they yeah, call. they'd all have to be updated. But the nice thing about this approach to transactions is you might have a lot of different places that need to be updated, yeah. but there's a single commit. And that commit is when you've actually written this an Uber block successfully. So you can make all the changes you want to any blocks because you're not really changing them, you're just making duplicates. And you don't have to worry about how much change you make. Okay. Yeah. Questions, yeah. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're making, um, I just, just Come back to it when you want. Um, snapshots. Sometimes it's nice, like on Time Machine, on the Mac to, well, slightly different from that actually, would be to have a snapshot. Imagine you went to your home directory and you went to a dot snapshots directory. And it showed in it yesterday, sorry, an hour ago, two hours ago, three hours ago, yesterday, last week, last month. Would that ever be useful to you? Has any of you ever accidentally deleted a file or changed it in a way that you can't figure out how to go back? So if you could just go back in time, that'd be nice. Well, here's the deal. Here's your live route. No one says we have to actually delete this. Right? You, you could delete this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Can you delete these three? No, because they're in use from our current snapshot. So basically, what we, our, our current route. We can say the blocks that are reachable from any route, we can't free. But any that are not reachable by any route can be freed. So this is a garbage collection issue. So what about, yeah. um, I don't know if you already answered this, but the blocks, like let's say you keep crashing, like those blocks, are they still marked in use? Which ones? These? Yeah, the green ones. Like if the green ones. They would be marked in use by the storage allocator. The higher level system has to actually find that these are no longer used and free them. Okay. So there's still some work that has to happen in cleaning that. Yeah. So at what point would they be free? Like after a snapshot? Or because it seems like this process, like you go through the four steps and then you have two kind of disjoint trees and then you go through and you take a snapshot. And then at that point, like what else could you do? Well, you don't take a snapshot. The snap, I mean, it, it just happens to exist, yes. right, really. Um, and so what you could then do is go through and start freeing this stuff. Okay. Um, is there any reason you would keep it around after the midst of the tree? It is a snapshot. Would you do anything else before you free it, or is that an immediate, like, free it? So you might say, they might want this around later. I'm going to keep it. Okay. Or you would free it. But if they're not going to want it around later, then, yeah, you'll get rid of it. And when this stuff free... When this stuff gets freed, if you actually uh, crash and come back up, I'm, I'm not sure whether it happens just as part of that process or not. All right, let's stop here. Two things, two or three things. One, um, the MMAP lab, which at one point said it's due today, is actually due Wednesday. So if you've done it, that's great. If you haven't, it's due Wednesday. Second. I just started grading Lab 4. I know I'm behind. I'll try and get Lab 4 and then Lab 5 done. Uh, sorry, Lab 4B and Lab 4C done. Uh, lab 5 is due a week from Thursday. If you guys have a non-working Lab 4C, talk to me, and I can provide you a repository with a working Lab 4C. And finally, 
starting Monday, your readings, you're going to actually have some homework on the readings. You're going to have to submit two questions. Sorry. You're going to have to submit an answer to a question I give you and a question of your own about the readings. All the readings are up 